Hello, everyone. Thank you for coming into the automation track of the Qt World Summit. We have, I know it's uh, late, we have two more sessions uh, before the end of the summit, but we have Mathieu, the Vice President of Technology at Timesys, talking us about walking through how to secure Qt based Linux devices. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mathieu. Thank you. How is everyone so far? Good two days, right? A lot of technology, a lot of great topics, and um, this is not the last session of the day, but uh, it's, I think, interesting. And unfortunately, we have only 25 minutes. Uh, unfortunately, because I can talk about security for, um, well, hours, and uh, given that we have 25 minutes, the agenda is pretty short. We're gonna start by talking about why security is important. And um, then, very briefly, we're going to look at the structure of a Qt-based Linux product, and we're going to look at what software layers can be secured um, in order to ship a secured product. Um, so, talking about security topics and uh, some of the techniques, technologies that are available today um, to you to have your device fully secured and then keep it secure over time. Because that's the, I guess, very important aspect of keeping the device secure. It's, it's not what you do up front, it's uh, what you keep on doing after you release your product, right? Security is not something that you do once. But first, a couple of scary stories. Um, when do we hear about security? <laughs> well, typically we hear about security when there's an issue. And uh, I, I I'm going to use two examples, one where uh, a malware software was installed in a cloud. And this malware software got into an embedded device that um, did not suspect that something unauthorized can be installed in a file system. And the only um, goal of that malware device was to erase the contents of the flash device. So this is where all the software lives and then disappear, right? So it was difficult for a device in the in a cloud, an IoT device that's um, gathering information, input with beautiful QT display to recover from that if it didn't have a security um, designed into the product, okay? Um, so that's one scary story. Uh, the second scary story is, uh, <clears throat> Well, in the US, uh, people like to sue for everything. So uh, <laughs> I don't know how it is in, in, in many European countries, but uh, uh, Jeep Cherokee owners um, filed a lawsuit um, <clears throat> because the company that put the multimedia system in the car, um, multimedia system that had full access to all the different car subsystems was not secured. And two researchers, just using Wi-Fi, were able to get into the car and take the control over uh, steering, braking, um, well, almost everything, right? So can you imagine that? You're driving a car and someone just turns the wheel, right? Scary. So security is very, very important and uh, people are becoming more and more aware of um, how security can affect them or lack of security can affect uh, the lights, the products that they are working with. Uh, <clears throat> so it doesn't matter whether you are working with a commercial embedded operating system or open source, none of that code is um, fully secure. And uh, uh, if you think about how to approach the uh, topic of securing the device, you may think, okay, so I can spend time um, implementing all the security recommendations and then stay on top of different security feeds to keep my device secure. Yes, you can do that, but it's a very manual process. Um, so whereas implementing security in your product is not something that uh, someone else can do for you, I, I mean, people can as services, um, Providing you with appropriate security feed can be very easily solved. Okay? There are companies that um, can provide that security feed. The first step, though, in assessing your security uh, threat level is to perform an audit of your device. Uh, and in that audit, 
you're going to be looking for different uh, hotspots, security hotspots, right? So what can cause the device to um, uh, break or someone to take control of the device? And um, we're going to talk a little bit more about what that means uh, from different software layers, Linux software layers. Um, but once you identify those issues, you're going to try to limit the surface of attack, limit the uh, amount of software and different angles in which that software can be hacked. Uh, so that's what we call system hardening a little bit. Uh, <clears throat> As part of the process, you're also going to continue to monitor different vulnerabilities because this is uh, uh, software, especially open source, is a living and breathing mechanism, right? <laughs> or organism. Uh, you're going to have uh, quite a lot of people contributing code that ends up in your hands. So uh, staying on top of different security vulnerabilities that open source um, can intentionally or unintentionally introduced to your product uh, is important. So let's take a look at the um, Qt Linux-based uh, device structure. We have a beautiful UI. We have an uh, embedded device with a processor. And on that device, we have uh, several software layers. We have a bootloader, we have a Linux kernel, and we have a file system where our Qt application lives, uh, together with Qt libraries, um, and of course, other system stuff, okay? Um, looking at the device, immediately you're going to think, oh, so sitting in an airplane seat and having that USB port in front of me allows me to connect. Okay, well, that's an entry, a security flaw, maybe, <laughs> right? So uh, when you try to design a uh, very, very secure product, QT product, you have to look at how um, someone would be operating that hardware. And then how the different components um, connect to the uh, vital pieces of the operating system and your application. And I've mentioned quite a few. Um, one of the big ones uh, that I've seen over and over again was to have a console access on UART. Um, in production devices that oftentimes uh, stays there. So if someone can connect a serial port to a device, uh, <clears throat> and better yet, have a root access on the console, that is a big security flaw, right? So you have to be aware of those different areas where um, someone could gain access to your device. So talking about device security layers, there are several of them. Uh, we talk oftentimes about making sure that uh, the data that application is producing and managing is uh, securely stored. Uh, we have uh, uh, some options to um, make sure that no one can access the hardware, that cannot remove, um, I don't know, a processor or a flash chip. Um, we want to ensure that there is a security around how my application executes. If, if there was a separation, in memory and in um, how the CPU is being used by a Qt application, there wouldn't be uh, a possibility of a malware or some other software to access that data and modify it. Right? So uh, secure execution is important. Who is logging into the system is also important. Um, we want to ensure secure data communication and network access. Uh, so security, you can see, is multi-level um, challenge. I'm going to call it challenge because there is no universal uh, medicine that would solve the security problem for all products. Okay. <clears throat> so uh, if you ask me, how secure am I? Um, well... <laughs> It's always a function of money and resources. If there is a company that is uh, going to put a lot, million bucks and uh, a lot of resources trying to break into your device, sure, they will find a vector. And good example here is Apple. So many developers, so many engineers spent so much time um, working on proprietary operating system that was locking it down. And one of the initial problems, problems, <laughs> 
limitations was that it was running on selected networks, right? But very quickly, there was a group of engineers that thought, well, I want to run it on another network, and they broke in. So it's always a function of um, how much time and how many resources are put in the, in the hacking effort. Now, that's why what's important is to pay a lot of attention to the upfront design of the entire system, building in different security measures, but that's step one, but also then to um, introduce to your product, to the, um, the way the product is maintained, a special process where you keep the product secure. Okay. We'll talk about it a little bit more. So step one, let's assess how unsecure our software is. And uh, here we're going to ask quite a few questions, right? We're gonna be asking questions, how do we protect against unauthorized access? How do you lock down software? How do you um, securely code your Qt application? Um, if there is IP or different algorithms, how do I protect those algorithms from leaving um, my device? A, a good example that I can give you is um, payment terminal. When you introduce the credit card into that payment terminal, and you don't have a trusted access to the data that was read from the um, uh, strip on the back of the card or, or from the chip, um, well, that's a security issue, right? Because someone can, um, using another bot application, collect all that data. Um, so if we go into authenticate the software that runs on our device, and that's one of uh, one ways of keeping the device secure, how am I going to store the keys that were used to authenticate the software? So uh, many questions that you're going to uh, end up asking yourselves when you design your um, Qt-based uh, secure device. And uh, the approach that uh, we champion is to think about security as something that you don't bolt on existing device, but something that you start your design with, okay? If you, if you know that your device needs to be secure and stay secure over time, you want to engineer your product with security in mind. How do you go about this? Um, first, you guys are going to start with a reference board from a, a board vendor, an XP or some other board vendor. And it comes with reference software. That reference software is going to already have certain mechanisms that will allow you to uh, implement security or, or experience security on a reference board. So it will allow you to understand what are the different mechanisms available to you from Linux and from the hardware itself that can help you keep your device secure. Okay, So that's step one. Step two is when you start to reflect your requirements in your own custom design. Okay, So we're talking about all software layers in your design, starting with a bootloader, starting with how you think about um, the software and its functionality. If you want to have a fallback mechanism, uh, very useful in a secure device, because if you're sending an update over the air to a device and the update fails to flash correctly into the device, well, if there is no rescue partition on the device, the device is host, right? So um, oftentimes you end up creating multiple partitions, recovery partitions, fallback partitions, but that's something that you start your design with. And that's a, a strong requirement that we see amongst our customers that want to design secure devices. Uh, when it comes to applications and um, execution in a trusted way, um, ARM architecture comes to rescue, or not rescue, but help. Um, they implemented um, trust zones directly in the hardware that allow you to uh, separate the trusted execution environment from untrusted execution environment. So I can have a, a portion of my application, an algorithm or reading a credit card data, execute it in a trusted zone. And um, the result of authentication of that credit card can be handled in untrusted zone. Okay, so hardware comes to, uh, to help 
in a secure topic. So at this point, we have a device with different secure measures, secure boots. Um, let's say there, that there is security applied to all software stacks. We are shipping the product, right? Product is shipped, product is in people's hands. Uh, it's in uh, factories installed as a control unit, controlled panel. And uh, that's not over. As I mentioned earlier, uh, staying on top of security is as important, if not more important, than the initial implementation of security. Because over time, the number of attack vectors onto your device is going to grow. So in order to keep it in check, you have to push out updates to your device with security fixes. Okay? Uh, many of our customers end up having either part of the engineering team or there is a dedicated security team handle that. And um, what they do is they simply um, receive a security feed with all the vulnerability information and they decide, okay, this is something that's important to my device, this is not. And on a regular basis, they push out updates, okay? But that's not to say that this is the process that everyone has to follow. Every company can design their own process, but you have to be aware that there is this ongoing security um, uh, issue which you have to manage as part of your secured product. Okay, so um, talking about device security a little bit more. Uh, we have to start with um, booting. Booting the device and uh, booting the device by authenticating the software. Uh, I want to make sure that what I boot on my device really came from me and that uh, someone did not inject um, their own software right? that would steal the data. Um, so secure boot helps with authentication of different software layers. And of course, the, for the root file system, there's also a possibility of uh, hiding the content. So encryption can come into play. Then we can ensure secure communication and trusted application execution uh, with a trusted execution environment supported by trust zones from ARM. Okay, uh, let's continue. Uh, so talking about security, physical security is easy, I think, <laughs> because uh, you, you can decide which components to disable what not to use, which ports to hide. You can have your own types of connectors, which if a hacker doesn't have the same exact port that you're using on your device, they're not gonna connect. Um, but hardware oftentimes provides the uh, temper detection, uh, which uh, would erase as part of the process the contents of the memory when the power is disconnected, okay? <clears throat> So hardware comes uh, with help. Now, talking about authentication, I wanted to um, put in front of you this slide because I, I don't know if nomenclature that I'm gonna use in, in the next slide is uh, obvious to everyone. Um, hash functions are commonly used as a way to uniquely identify um, a file or a piece of code, right? So how do we get to a hash file? Uh, typically, there is a, a key involved in, uh, that combined with the original file would generate uh, a hash file. So those keys, uh, we have two types of keys. We have symmetric keys and asymmetric keys. What's the difference? Asymmetric keys means that in a process, we're going to use two different keys. Okay? Symmetric keys means that you can use the same key for the operation. So authentication uses asymmetric keys. Encryption uses symmetric keys. So I'm gonna start with authentication. Uh, and uh, I'm gonna talk about it in a, around secure boot. Uh, so in case of secure boot, we have uh, a bootloader, but this is all on a host PC, right? So on a host PC, what you would do is you would prepare the bootloader by computing the hash using your private key to generate a signature. Then you attach the signature to a bootloader itself, <clears throat> and then you flash that in a target device. In a target device, you're also going to have a corresponding public key, okay? So that's what I mean by asymmetric. Private key, 
public key. Boot ROM, we're going to assume that is secure. Okay, that's something that uh, semiconductor vendor can help with. Okay, so I have boot ROM loading the bootloader, computes the hash in the process, and uh, then uses the signature. Boot ROM is going to use the signature to uh, unsign it with a public key, and I'm going to get a decrypted hash. If those two hashes match, okay, authenticate it. So the software can run, right? Um, and uh, what's nice about this and the hardware support for it is that this public key oftentimes is stored directly on the hardware and the fuses are blown. So what does it mean? Uh, it means that once you blow the fuses, no one else can store any other public key in the device. Okay? So only the software authenticated with that private key can ever run on that device. So that has good and bad sides, right? Uh, bad sides if we are doing that to a development system. Good sides if we are doing that to a production system. But that uh, brings another challenge. How do we manage those private keys? Right? Where do we keep them? How do we ensure the security of private keys? So you can see that this is a multi-layered um, challenge, but um, this uh, storing the um, keys in the hardware is supported by a growing number of CPUs. From almost all vendors that I know of, um, Secure Boot is supported. <clears throat> now, booting is one step. Now we have to expand this to all software layers. We talked about bootloader. Uh, what about Linux kernel? What about root file system? Well, that continues. It's you create a root, I mean, chain of trust with a root key of trust stored directly in the hardware. Okay, so your application, by the time it runs, uh, you're going to know that it came from the uh, authenticated root file system. Um, and if you want to either well, take it to the next step, you can uh, use cryptography. You can encrypt the contents of the uh, root file system. You can encrypt the contents of uh, what your application produces. Um, and that's definitely one of the commonly used security measures employed by our customers. In Linux, you're going to have quite a few available options. There is a DM verify if you have a read-only file system. You have DM encrypt if your application is supposed to write data to the, to the root file system. Right? Um, so encryption is important, but you have to uh, keep in mind that uh, security and especially encryption um, limits the use of certain open source software. Right? And when we're talking about Qt specifically, we know that 5.9 Qt is distributed as uh, uh, LGPL version 3, GPL version 3, and uh, commercial. Um, and uh, <clears throat> when you use encryption, you pretty much have to use commercial. right? And that's actually a good thing, because that's going to keep uh, your device even more secure. OK, uh, I'm flagged here that I have two minutes. So I'm going to accelerate a little bit. And uh, I'm going to skip next two slides. And I wanted to very quickly talk to you about the trusted execution environment that's supported by ARM. Uh, so a uh, trusted execution environment runs alongside of the rich operating system such as Linux or Android. And it provides the isolation environment where parts of your application can execute in the controlled uh, manner. They have uh, dedicated access to a CPU to uh, also um, cache lines, as well as memory. There is no way that an untrusted application can access memory that is used by trusted application. Okay? That's, uh, that's forbidden and Opti. And um, just to give you an idea here, uh, Opti, this is a normal world. This is a secure world. And a secured world is supported by a trusted OS that uh, channels different uh, specific APIs to your application here. So we're talking about executing in a trusted way portions of your code, not necessarily the entire Qt application, OK? Something to keep in mind. And lastly, uh, I'm going to uh, 
overstaying my presence here by a minute. Um, the um, monitoring the security is important, as I mentioned, because that's the second half of keeping uh, the device secure. And you have to uh, have a way to uh, continuously monitor, get some notification and fixes to um, the um, different issues that your product, your application may encounter. Uh, and in Linux world, uh, those are called, well, not only in Linux world, common vulnerabilities and exposures. And there's quite a few of them. If you look at um, CVE list today, you're gonna find hundreds of them. And they affect uh, protocols such as Secure Shell, um, which is supposed to be secure, right? Um, and many, many other aspects of uh, potentially your product design. So staying on top of those um, uh, CVE updates and uh, finding the ones that apply to you um, can be easily done. You can either do this yourself or you can leverage uh, um, companies like Timesys that would provide you with uh, modified security feed that only matches the security issues that your product can be vulnerable to. Okay? So with that, uh, thank you so much for your time. I hope you have the great rest of the uh, evening at this point. And uh, well, I hope that this presentation um, but some topics that uh, are of interest to you. Okay, thank you. <clears throat>